Amen. Let's sing our hymnals this morning. Hymn number 532. 532, Heavenly Sunlight. Let's sing all three verses. Hymn number 532. Walking in sunlight all of my journey Over the mountains, through the deep vale Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee Promise divine that never can fail my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and guide. He is the light, in Him is no darkness. Close to his side, heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, lighting my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises. Jesus is mine. On that last verse, in the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way mansions above singing his praises gladly I'm walking walking in sunlight sunlight of love heavenly sunlight heavenly sunlight flooding my soul with glory divine hallelujah I am rejoicing singing his praises Jesus is Amen. Great singing this morning. You may be seated.
our Bibles this morning, I'm going to invite you to open to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Last week, we finished our two-part message on the Ten Commandments, and we read the tail end of it this morning. Brother Chu led, this, led us in the reading. With God saying to Moses in verse 22, And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked to you from heaven. You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. What an amazing wonder that the God, the eternal God, the omnipotent God, the omnipresent God, the omniscient God, without beginning and end, the God who created all things, Jehovah, the self-existent God, the God of truth and holiness, the God of mercy and of love, that that God would care enough to take time to speak with you and me. To declare his plan, to show us his purpose for us, and how we can be blessed in him, and have a godly, peaceful existence with one another. You know, God said to Moses, Moses, these instructions have been given for your benefit. And if my people, and indeed all people, will take heed to my words, it will go well with them on planet earth. And such is the wonder and love of our God and our creator. But you know, God loved the human race so much that he did not just end with the Ten Commandments, but he has continued to speak with us from heaven. Because God knew that we, even to this day, would need guidance to help us. We would need comfort in our sorrow. We would need uh, courage in the face of our fears. We would need rebuke when we would wander from God. And we would need to learn from him how much he loved us, and how he was willing to become, as we just heard about in song, the lamb to take our place and shed his blood. You see, for as long as there are people upon planet earth, we need to hear from heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, for the honor and privilege that you have given me to stand behind this sacred desk, as we sometimes call it. Lord, a place in which we can uh, open the Word of God. We can explore it. And Father, I pray this morning a simple message that we will consider. But Lord, I pray that it will be a time of encouragement and instruction. And Lord, yes, rebuke to our hearts. And Lord, we will give you the honor and praise for allowing us this time. For it's in your name we ask all of these things. Amen. Paul was nearing the end of his life and as he sat under house arrest in Rome he often thought about his younger friend and fellow laborer in the gospel Timothy Timothy was a fine man a dedicated man a man with great potential and yet Paul knew that Timothy at times struggled with fears and discouragement he had a bit of some health problems as well and it seemed really all across the world at that time as the faith in Jesus Christ was spreading, it seemed also that opposition from every side was increasing in their fierceness and in their determination to really oppose and to stop the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul had reminded Timothy that the fear that often gripped his heart was not really from God. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 we read, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Paul had gone on to remind Timothy of his calling to the ministry by the Lord and challenged him to hold fast to the sound words, to be strong in grace, to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And Timothy would need those words of encouragement because indeed as we go all the way to chapter 3 we find that perilous times had come upon them all. The society of that day was controlled under the realm of the wicked one. And that means that their only character would indeed be wickedness and opposition. And he said in chapter 3 and verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Let's look at 
chapter 3 of this book, 2 Timothy, and I'm going to begin reading in verse number 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. As Paul sat there under house arrest, certainly at this moment being filled with the Holy Spirit, maybe pausing before he went on, the, the message seems so very clear. Timothy, don't quit. Timothy, continue thou. Keep pressing on. Uh, this is our only choice if we would be found faithful. And Timothy, take hold of those things that you've been taught. Make certain that you don't let them go and that you continue in following them. Remember the faithfulness of those who shared with you his truth. Verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You see, Timothy had been well instructed in the word of God. His mother and his grandmother had taken upon themselves to ensure that this boy, if he knew anything, that he would know the holy scriptures. I'm sure Timothy as a young man got excited when they began to read him the story about David and Goliath or when they began to tell him about the, the captain of the Lord's host meeting with Joshua or how the walls of Jericho fell down or even old Elijah on top of Mount Carmel calling down fire from heaven. The reality is, is that Timothy was well versed in the Holy Scriptures he knew the Bible enough that when he heard that the Messiah had finally arrived and that Messiah was Jesus Christ, he quickly was one to turn from his sin and place his faith in Jesus Christ. Parents, I'm going to tell you something. Your kids cannot get enough of the Word of God. You know, they don't need to be able to recite every line from every Pixar movie that they see. You say, well, those are sort of harmless, fun things. Yes, I understand that. But they don't need to know the latest video games or online attractions. Let them read the Bible. Let them read the stories that come from the Word of God. You know, uh, uh, read the Bible to them if they're not able to read yet. Honor this book before them. Encourage them to listen in Sunday school and in master clubs. And, and yes, have them listen even in church. <laughs> We find in Isaiah that it is line upon line and precept upon precept that our hearts are instructed and guided in God's truth. So Paul, understanding this about his young friend Timothy, speaks to one of the greatest issues for Timothy and his need to be strong and to press on in faith and ministry. And the Holy Spirit sets before us this precious volume that we have in our hands this morning this book called the bible it is the greatest of all our personal treasures it's the anchor for our soul it's like the sword of goliath and there's none like it give it me the next two verses that we're going to look and we're going to study here this morning going to talk and address the power of the word of god but there are verses that are often quoted. Maybe you have committed them to memory. You've probably, if you're in Christian school, you've probably had to learn them. I know Bible college students have to do it at some point in their college career. And they are foundational to our understanding of the Word of God, its power and its transmission. It is, you know, God's Word has come from the mind of God to the mind of man. It is from His heart to our heart. And your grasp of the truth contained here really, I believe, can direct the course of your entire life. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Rabbi Zacharias is a Christian apologist and intellectual. He's a really smart man. He's interesting to read. Um, 
But he spends his, his ministry is basically he's willing to venture into public and secular venues and, and argue for the things of Christ. And he's quite good at it. Uh, certainly, we can't give all blanket endorsements, but uh, I've read a few works by him and they're always very interesting. And so he tells of an experience that he once had at the uh, Ohio State University. And I quote, a few weeks ago, I did a lectureship at Ohio State University and I, as I was being driven to the lecture, we passed by the new Wexner Art Center, Center for the Arts. And the driver said, this is a new art building for the university. It's a fascinating building designed with a post-modernist view of reality. The building has no pattern. There are stairways that go nowhere, pillars that support nothing. The architect designed the building to reflect a life that goes nowhere and is mindless and senseless. It is the testimony to postmodern thinking. He goes on to say, I turn to the man describing it and ask, did they do the same thing with the foundation? He laughed. No, you can't do that with the foundation. You have to have something steady to build upon. He goes on. You can get away with random thoughts that sound good in defense of a worldview that ultimately doesn't make sense. But once you start tampering with the foundation, you begin to see serious effects. End of quote. Do you know people who are like the Wexner Art Center? They have staircases going nowhere, pillars supporting nothing. Do you also know people who have maybe taken a lot of freedom and a lot of liberty to play with a lot of things going on in their lives and then begin to mess with the foundations upon which their lives are built? What has been the result? You see, people can try to base their lives upon all kinds of foundations, but there's really only one foundation that is completely reliable. God is the creator and designer of life. He has given us his word as the foundation for our lives. And building your life upon any other foundation, I'm going to tell you, will only lead to ruin. Now notice how the verse begins, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture. That means both Old and New Testament. Every book, every chapter, every word is God-inspired. I've shared with you in the past, and uh, again, I like to share with you Greek words. Many of you don't remember them past the moment I say them, and that's okay, but this word is the word theonoustos, and basically it means God-breathed. That's what inspiration is all about. The word of God has the very breath of God in it. God breathed. He, he filled the word of God. I always liken it to, uh, to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 where the Bible tells us about the creation of Adam. So God knelt down and, and formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. That's what makes us unique from all the rest of God's creation. They are living creatures, but we have a living soul that will spend eternity somewhere. So I think about that act of God breathing into Adam the breath of life. And so it is with the Word of God. It is a book that is God-breathed. Hebrews tells us that it is alive, quick, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. So this book that we have before us is God-breathed. And notice also the completeness. It says all Scripture. Now, what does God mean by that? It means that the Bible isn't divided up. This is inspired. This is not inspired. The Bible doesn't have parts that, okay, really pay attention here. And this one, well, maybe not so much. You see, all of the Bible, the Bible does, does not contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. Now, the, the Bible has a lot of critics. And they want to point out you know, that Paul, Paul, it seems, doesn't seem to think like James thinks. And, and, and John, the, the writer of the Gospel of John, seems like he has a different view of Christ than, than Matthew or Mark or Luke. And this difference in focus and subject, we need to understand, it does, there's no contradictions. There's no disagreements in the Bible. God had a purpose for doing so. I'll tell you what, to be honest with you, if you think about the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, let's not go any further than that. Just think about those four accounts. If all four were identical word for word from one end to the other of them, what purpose would there be to have four of them? 
Now, if you, if you become a student of the Word of God, you'll begin to discover that God had a different purpose for each of those gospel accounts, and each one of them present the Lord Jesus Christ in a different light and with a different perspective. There's no conflicts between the Lord Jesus and Paul, or Paul and James, or Isaiah, or Moses, David, Peter, John, anyone else. God chose to give his truth through different perspectives. Uh, perspectives. God <clears throat> oversaw the whole process and yet he allowed his thoughts to be communicated through people who wrote and spoke from a different time frame, a different education, a different personality. And yet we can trust God's word to be true because he is true. Now listen to me carefully. The Bible is a cooperative effort between God himself and the individuals he chose to write the scriptures. What do I mean by that? God chose to use individual personalities of the men who penned the scriptures to explain what God wanted to communicate with us. But God was the originator of the Bible and every element down to the tiniest, the Bible says jot and tittle, Hebrew markings, the crossing of the T, the period, every single word was placed there by God. Listen to me carefully. Nothing in the Bible was added by men. And nothing that God wanted to be said was left out. It is inspired. It is infallible. It is eternal. Peter tells us in his second epistle how this came about. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation... For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? That word move means carried along. God the Holy Spirit carried those men to where God wanted them to be. And so the human authors of scripture were led to write. And as they did, yes, maybe their styles were there, their personalities, but it explain, and it explains the differences between Paul and John and Matthew and every other human agent. But God's word is unique because God says, I have superintended over every single word. You know, God's word is unique because it gives us insight into who God is. Tells us what he wants us to know about himself. He tells us what he expects of us. It's God's story, it's his commentary on history, and it's really the owner's manual for how we should live. A mother sat in church next to her first grade daughter one Sunday and noticed she had her Bible open, the mother did, and the little girl was staring intently at the Bible as a first grader might do. And after a few moments of looking carefully at her Bible open on her lap, she whispered to her mom, she said, did God really write that? And of course, the mother quietly whispered that, yes, he did. Looking down at her mother's Bible, the little girl said, wow, he has really neat handwriting. <laughs> you know what? God has really neat handwriting because he wants you to know him. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And I want you to notice, secondly, that it is profitable. There is profit. This book, because it is the very breath of God in and through it, then it is profitable. That means it makes it worthwhile. It, there is value in it. There's value that can come to each and every circumstance of our lives. And God has spoken to uh, an outline, really, how God's word can profit our lives. Notice, first of all, it is profitable for doctrine. Now, a lot of people get really scared when they hear the word doctrine. Uh, they think of doctrine as being some sort of a elusive scope of massive uh, rules and regulations, uh, uh, a debate, doctrine. Well, that talks about how many angels can dance upon the head of a pin. Uh, all kinds of interesting questions have been posed down through the years. Could God create a rock that was bigger than he could lift it? And, you know, just all kinds of very fascinating, silly things. The word doctrine, just understand, the word doctrine simply means teaching. That's all it means is teaching. So the word of God is profitable for teaching. It's, it's 
God's manual as to how we're to conduct our affairs in our homes, in our churches, where we work, in society in general. It deals with our personal behavior and how we should treat those of our families and and our fellowships and how we should conduct ourselves out in the world. It is a place of instruction as to what God is like and how he came to save us. And really when you think about it, teaching in this sense is a very positive activity because it sets... You know, it sets before us the clearness of our Christian faith and practice. The Word of God begins to profit because it shows me what is right. But notice it is also profitable for reproof. Now, what is reproof? Reproof is a form of rebuke, of scolding. Um, How many of you like to be scolded? It's always for, well, yeah, sometimes it is. <laughs> uh, when we are rebuked, when we are reproved by God, it definitely is for our own good. How many of you have ever really convinced yourself that you were right? And that what you were doing or what you had done was right? And then when you got and sat down with your Bible and began to focus on it, Somehow there was this verse, (laughs) and this verse just came along as you were reading your Bible, just, you know, full confidence that you were on the right path, and that verse sort of jumped off the page and said, read carefully. And you had to take a deep breath and say, I was wrong. And to make matters worse, there was probably somebody that you had to go and repeat those words. I mean, it's good. You need to say it to God. God, I was wrong, but God says, here's reproof. You know, it points out. You see, when we are reproved of the sin and the error in our lives, it opens the door for God's truth to come in. No matter how much we may not like the message, reproof from the Bible simply shows me where I'm wrong. And I can always count on God to reveal that to me through his word. Shows me when I'm headed in the wrong direction. Shows me when my attitudes are not where they need to be. Shows me when my thinking has been become worldly or self-centered. Shows me when um, I've not been careful in the things that I say. The things that dwell within my heart. You know the Bible can do that because it is a living book and because it does pierce even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. To divide asunder means to divide. Every one of us this morning came to church with a front on. When you got dressed today, you not only put on clothes, but you put on how you will interact with people. Some of you today came and, and, and you're in a state of agitation and upset. Things are not going well with you, but you'll smile, shake a hand. Hey, how are you? Amen, brother. God's good. Others come with grieving souls and hearts. And yet we... But you know what? You and I don't always get beyond that because even though we love one another, we're not necessarily always that close to one another. It's only for husbands and wives. It's only after many years that you begin to pick up those just little nuances that tell you that something's wrong in your husband's life. He's struggling with something or he's burdened with something or something's your wife is burdened with something. But you know what? The word of God it goes beyond all the facade that you've put on to come here today. And God penetrates to the heart, piercing even to the divine center of soul and spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents, your intentions, your motives of the heart. We can convince ourselves of a lot of things. We're pretty good at deceiving ourselves. God's word goes right to the place and he is willing to, to reprove us. God's standard is perfect. And whenever you and I get out of alignment, God's word will show us. Now, most of you know that a few meters from my front door, um, they're going to be building a 30-story tower. And I'm talking a few meters. I'm talking from here to Victoria Drive. That's how close it's going to be. 
Now, I used to say they're planning to build a 30-story tower. Now I say they're building because all of the old buildings are gone and they've taken already down about two meters of dirt and they're continuing to dig and the trucks are going. And so I talked with some guys the other day. Uh, I went down to see what was going on, talked with a couple of guys there with you know fancy hard hats on and looked very official, had clipboards and iPads and all that kind of stuff. And as they were sitting there and I said, so, and they said, well, at least three years. We'd like to get it done in three years and to go on and talk about that. But I do know this. Over the next three years, there's going to be people there all the time. And they're going to have uh, survey transits. They're going, to have, they're going to have plumb lines. They're going to have things running. They're going to have blueprints with them. And they're going to continually be checking to make certain that that building is going up correctly. I hope so, because I don't want it to fall, right? And they will go back to the design of that building and the blueprints and they will double check and triple check and quadruple check. And if they find anything that the workers have somehow done wrong or it's not been dug deep enough or this isn't shored up enough or this isn't straight enough, they'll say you must fix it or else we'll have big trouble. You know what? That's what the word of God does. It's the blueprint. It comes along to each one of us. And if we begin to build out of alignment, we begin to stray from God's path. God says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. What you're doing is not correct. It must be fixed. Get back in line. It is profitable for reproof. But notice also it says it is profitable for correction. Correction. Now, that's the nice thing. God's word doesn't leave us in this out of alignment state. God just doesn't shout and say, hey, you're out of bounds. No, he says, here's where you need to be. Let me show you. This is, this is, this is the way, walk ye in it. This is the path. Now, get back over here. <laughs> And it may be a difficult process. We may have to be ready to give up some of our sin. We may have to repent in our hearts. We may have to yield ourselves to the Bible's absolute truth. <clears throat> but I'll tell you, if we follow closely what God has said, the wonderful thing about God's grace is that we can get back on track. We can get back to where God wants us to be. We can, we can uh, you know, if our life is bent or misshapen or, or, or one that is uh, gone in the wrong direction, it can be corrected and brought back so that it will honor and glorify God and is a joy to live. You see, the Bible has been given to us to straighten us out and show us the right way. And then lastly, I want you to see that it's profitable for instruction in righteousness. You see, here's, here's this pattern, and I know in, in years gone by, I've shared this pattern with you. So here's the pattern. God says, here's what's right. Here's what's right. This is, this is my perfect standard. I am God, and you're not. And this is how you need to live. This is the mindset. This is the truth. And we say, yes, I believe the word of God is perfect and infallible. I believe that. But then the next step, it's good for us. It's profitable because then God says, you're wrong. And here's where you are wrong. And here's where you need to take care of this. There needs to be repentance. There needs to be, you know, understanding of your error. But then God says, okay, now here's how you can get right. Here's how you can get back on the right path. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then the last thing, the instruction in righteousness, God says, now here's how you, you don't have to go back and do the same thing over again. Here's how you can stay right. Here's how you can keep on that right path. Here are the things that you need to avoid. You need to stay away from that path. You need to, you know, make certain that, that you are avoiding those kinds of friends that lead you astray. Here's the things that you need to be putting aside and getting out of your lives. God's word says, I want to train you and guide you to live in the right way. We, a verse we often quote about our children, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. You know, a great thing is God is wanting to train all of us. That means to shape us and to put boundaries around us and say, if you go that way, it's going to be a great help to you. You know, what a marvelous book this Bible is. And it's been given to us by the living God who made us and knows us better than we know ourselves and knows the end from the beginning. God knows every time that you deviate from his path. He knows if you'll stay on that, that deviated path where it's going to end up. A lot of times people say, boy, I don't know how I got here. God says, I know. <laughs> it's because you were, not, you were not connected with my word. And God has taken time to communicate with us 
what is right, where we are wrong, how we can get right, and how we can stay right. I have spoken with you from heaven, God says. Well, verse 17 says that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So let's talk about perfection. You see, the individual who wishes to be a man or woman of God will be able to be so if they will abide in his word. The old and simple adage is this, that this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. I went out to the youth retreat last week and, and uh, just went out to visit out there for a moment. On the way back in, I stopped off in uh, Chilliwack. And in Chilliwack, there's a little bookstore there uh, sponsored by the Trinitarian Bible Society. Now, you may be familiar with them or not, but they, uh, they have a very strong position on the King James Bible, the TR, and uh, that's all they sell. And they also help, uh, they do a lot of work and ministry around the world in translation uh, based upon the TR, based upon the Masoretic text, do a great job. And uh, I, I sometimes, if I get a chance, they're not open very much, uh, just a little office, I stop and, and if I can time it, that's what I plan to do, go in and, and look at their selection of Bibles I did end up picking up another Bible, and they, they always have a good supply there. So, but uh, the, uh, the Canadian director of Trinitarian Bible Society was there, and we got to visit for a little bit. And he's got a long Dutch name about like this, so I could never pronounce it, so if, just forget uh, me ever. And, and I said to him um, that uh, we were talking about Bibles and the need to buy new Bibles from time to time. And, and, I, and I shared with him, you know, I said, uh, the thing is, he said, I said, it's an old saying, and the Bible, the physical Bible that is used and worn out usually belongs to somebody who is not. Now think about that. A Bible that is used and worn and well marked and maybe falling apart usually belongs to somebody who's not. And uh, he said, I've never heard that before. I thought, write it down. <laughs> You see, verse 17 says that the goal of doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction is that once we begin to implement God's word in our lives, then our lives can be what? The man of God may be perfect. And you say, wait a minute. There's no way I can ever be perfect. Well, let me explain to you what that word means. It means to be complete. It means to be thoroughly equipped. In other words, as you and I spend time in this book, God says, you know what? You can begin to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can find that you have the tools and the understanding that you need in your hand to be able to live a godly life in a very ungodly world. He said, you're going to be able to let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This is a state of maturity that is ready for the challenges that life brings to us. So instead of being <clears throat> always gripped by fear and being tossed about by every wind of doctrine, we have the confidence and trust that God will help us to continue. And the end result is a completeness that's not just about your personal godliness, but also has an impact on those around you, truly furnished, equipped unto all good works. See, God wants you to know the word of God, not just so that your life will be happy and blessed, but so that you'll have an impact on ministering to others. See, our ministry to others, if, if it's not backed by a life that is in line with the word of God, it's not really going to mean a whole lot. If it's not grounded in the truth of this book, I don't care how exciting we think we are, the truth of the matter is we're off base. Folks, I cannot tell you how important this book is is to your spiritual welfare. I, I read a little, little uh, message. Uh, I get an email from another Bible college in the States and they had a couple articles in it and I read one. It was, I thought it was really good. It was basically said, um, read your Bible. It's a pretty simple message, but I thought, man, that's a, that was a good message. Read your Bible. Why do we always emphasize reading your Bible? Because God gave us the Bible. It's the way that God speaks to us. 
It's the way that you and I can find instruction for life. It's the way that you and I can grow up in Christ and stop being spiritual babies. It is the way that we can learn how we can have victory over sin and not constantly be blown about by everything else, but how we become steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, we saw the last two Sundays, the Ten Commandments, and they're truly powerful and set before us as a guideline for a full and abundant life and how awesome it was that God would speak with us from heaven. But I'm thankful he didn't stop just there. He kept going and going and going. And he gives us his word with the very breath and power of God. It's a living book. Now, I remember growing up, and you say, boy, that's a pretty long time to remember. I know, I know. But I remember growing up and teaching it to many other young people down through the years, a little song that goes like this. The B-I-B-L-E is is that, that, the. (laughs) See, it's been too long since I've done it. Yes, the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. And then somewhere along the line they added, Spells Bible. How many of you know that song better than I do? Yeah. So let me ask you, is the B-I-B-L-E the book for you? Are you standing solely, that's what the word alone, are you standing solely on the word of God, on the Bible? Hmm. I wonder this morning, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to look at one other verse with you. Let's go back to uh, 1 Thessalonians, just a few pages away, and I'll be done. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And verse number 13. Paul writes to these believers in Thessalonica, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye, when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Notice that last phrase, it effectually worketh also in you that believe. You see, the word of God has been given not just for you and I to study as a textbook, not just for us to glean facts and, and figures and to know, you know, in what year, you know, Isaiah prophesied this or that. It is for us to allow the Word of God to work in us. D.L. Moody, a great evangelist from many years ago, said the scriptures were not given for our information, but for our transformation. So let me ask you this morning. If we have such a treasure before us, and I'm sure that really the vast majority of you this morning are saying, yes, that's, boy, that's the Bible. I know that. I know those verses. I've memorized those verses, and that's great. But I wonder if we understand what a treasure it is, how is it that we can so easily ignore it? How much time, how much time do we spend in this book as opposed to this book? Our iPads, our phones, our computers, the magazines that come to our homes, the newspaper, in front of the television set. Hours upon hours we spend there. And yet we struggle to spend 20 minutes in God's word each day. Television won't change your life. Except for the worse. You know, if we're going to survive, you know, we're ta- we've been talking about the end times. I'll be preaching again about Revelation tonight. And as we see our world getting obviously drawing closer and closer to the Lord's return. And we think about the day and age in which we live in which 
Governments are shutting down on us. Our own government is shutting down on us, our liberties of what we believe and practice. We talk about how perilous times have come. We're not going to be prepared. We're not going to be able to withstand those storms of however the Lord allows persecution to come. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If, if we don't have an anchor for our soul, if we don't have a foundation upon which we have built, and not just to sing a song, the B-I-B-L-E, but to say, I know this book, and I've spent time in it, and God has shown me what is right, and God has shown me when I'm wrong, and God showed me how I can get right with him, and God showed me how I can not keep repeating the same sin and the same error. God showed me that. But if I don't spend any time here, if I don't say, Lord, I need to hear from you. I need you to speak to me. I need you to, yeah. Well, I really don't want you to tell me when I'm wrong, but I know that I need to hear it. How are we going to survive? How are we going to survive? I've often thought about, you know, they always talk about the E, E, M, P, T, whatever, the burst that, what is that called? EMP? So they say, you know, we could have a solar flare that could knock out all the electrical systems, or of course we're saying people are working on weapons to be able to do that. And I've often thought, what would I do without my phone, my iPad, my computer, my television, without electricity? At least we still have paper Bibles, right? (laughs) Electricity can't take this away from me. But if I never spend any, it might be a, wow, look at that. God actually says something here. This is where we need to spend our time. My challenge to you today is I've been challenged again. We need to get back to the Bible. 